Thank you. The Ice Age Floods Institute is an organization that formed back in the 90s when it, there was first um, this whole phenomenon of these great uh, Pacific Northwest floods first started coming onto people's radar screen. And I think when my colleague Brad and I went out there, 97 or 98, they were meeting in a um, oh, in the back room of the, the Chamber of Commerce in Moses Lake, Washington. And now they've got several dozen chapters spread all over. So the, the, the awareness of this phenomenon is growing uh, exponentially, apparently. And um, this is one of their, their taglines on their website. It may be the greatest story yet untold. And it is a phenomenal story. We're gonna get into just all we're gonna be able to do tonight in an hour we have is just get into sort of an introduction. Um, this was the man that did all of the original research going back to the 1920s. Quite a controversial character back in his day. It took literally two to three decades before uh, mainstream geology was able to accept his idea of these catastrophic floods. And um, the main objection was that um, you cannot provide a source for the massive amounts of flood water required for your theory, therefore there were no floods. And at the time, he didn't have really a theory. Um, but he said, well, the evidence speaks for itself, it's there. Whatever the source of these floods were, there's no other explanation. When you put all of the evidence together in totality, there's no other conclusion that one can draw. And it's very much like um, when you, uh, some of you might be familiar with impact geology now, and you know that to confirm an impact event, uh, uh, a crater, an astrobleam, it's really multiple proxies that are, um, that are, are brought in, whether it's shock quartz or um, iridium or fallback breccia or vitrified rock, whatever the case may be, it's, you, you bring in all of these things and in the totality of it, there's really no other conclusion than you're looking at a, 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 an impact event. Um, it's much like that with the flood phenomenon. We'll go through as much as we can get into in about an hour and you'll see uh, a, kind of a cross section, a sample of what this kind of evidence is involved. In 28, in a, in a famous paper that he did, Harlan Bretz wrote, the region is unique. Let the observer take the wings of the morning to the uttermost parts of the earth. He will nowhere find its likeness. And in one of the uh, popular books written about the, the subject matter, Cataclysms on the Columbia, the author Marjorie Burns said, the geological detective tale that developed over the Spokane flood controversy is a tale of such sustained intrigue and epic proportions <laughs> that its unfolding makes most myth, fictional mystery plots seem trite in comparison. And finally, Everett C. Olson in his um, uh, introduction to uh, Harlan Bretz's final paper on the subject matter in 1969, he was referring to an outsized agent operating under extraordinary circumstances. So whatever the cause of this flood was, it was something that was extraordinary and outsized. So, We'll start with just kind of the, the broad overview here so you can kind of place, get a context for this. <clears throat> this shows North America around roughly 14 to 15,000 years before present. And you see the Great Laurentide Ice Sheet right here. And then you had the Cordilleran Ice Sheet here. The area we're gonna be focused on is this within this box, uh, which is basically the area where the flooding occurred. If you've heard of the Channel Scab Land, there, uh, 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 an erosional complex on the Columbia Basalt Plateau, which is a, a group of Miocene basalts that erupted between roughly six and 17 million years ago, and Lake Missoula, which is in western Montana. And so what we're gonna be mostly looking at is this area along the southern margin of the Cordillera and Ice Sheet and the Basalt Plateau, which is right there. And here's kind of the big picture of what we're looking at, and I can't really see it too well, so I'm gonna step down here. This is the basalt plateau right here. And the area that we're gonna be looking at tonight is mostly within this. Um, and you can actually see some, some of the erosional forms here. You see there's two of these great channeled scab land tracks here. They come down here and they're all ultimately heading towards the Columbia River, which is this uh, right here, which is headed out to the Pacific Ocean. Lake Missoula was actually back here in these uh, in these basins here. This is the Bitterroot Valley, which was one of the uh, distal basins for the uh, Lake Missoula. And this is the Flathead uh, Basin right here, which was another big reservoir of the, of the lake. Uh, if you can see, this is the Clark Fork River coming up this way, 
And this was the outlet for the draining of these basins. And here's a digital relief where you can kind of really begin to see much more clear what's going on. Here's very obviously the Columbia Basalt Plateau. And there are two lakes that are of uh, importance in understanding or deciphering this phenomenon. One of them is Lake Ponderé, which is right there. Uh, at, the, at the southern end of the Purcell Trench, which is this feature right here. This is the Flathead, Flathead Lake, which is at the southern end of the Rocky Mountain Trench, which is this great uh, downfaulted feature right here. And both of these, uh, these valleys were filled with Cordillera and glacial ice uh, during the uh, late Wisconsin, which was called the, the Fraser Glaciation out there in the northwest. And you can see on here, Right here is the Columbia going down here and then hooking to the north and out here by Astoria. There's a large fan off the co west coast of Oregon right here that was deposited by the sediment laden floodwaters. And here's a closer up uh, colorized digital relief of the same area. A Couple of things I wanna call your attention to here. We don't see Lake Ponderé up here. We'll get back to that in a second. Here's the Columbia Basalt Plateau you see the Columbia River coming down out of Canada here, hooking to the west in what's called the Great Bend region, hooks around this way, comes around, and right here, this is a, a feature I'm gonna call your attention to, it's called Wallula Gap. This is where all of these, this flood water that was uh, issuing uh, from the north and from the northeast coming over the Basalt Plateau, all had to discharge through this one gap right here, which then carried it down, through the Columbia Gorge here and then up and out into the ocean. You can also see there's multiple anticlinal ridges along in here that were upfolds probably between six and 10 million years ago, I think, um, that, that played a role in understanding and deciphering this phenomena. Okay, I'm gonna call your attention to this feature right here because we're gonna come and take a closer look at that. That's called Grand Coulee. <clears throat> and that gives its name to Grand Coulee Dam, which is the most massive poured concrete dam in North America at the present. It's not the tallest, but it is the most massive. And this feature right here is called Moses Coulee, which is another of the great coulees, which are uh, meltwater erosional tracts uh, that, are, that um, are quite mute evidence of the, of the uh, scale and power of these floods. This is the Okanagan River coming down here, out of here meeting the Columbia right here in this area. This is the Snake River coming in from the east and it meets the Columbia right here. Uh, it's coming up out of the uh, Oregon-Idaho border right here. Uh, this is Hell's Canyon right here. So the Snake is coming up this way. The Clearwater River comes in from the east as well. So all of these rivers are confluent. Uh, and then they flow through, uh, this was called Wallula Gap, which is, a, which is a break through this Horse Heaven Hills anticline right here. And here's basically a map of the region we're gonna be looking at. Here is Lake Pend Oreille, and here's the Clark Fork River Valley. Now Lake Pend Oreille was the site of the ice dam. The Purcell Trench Lobe came down out of Canada this way, blocked the wet, westward flow of the Clark Fork River right here, came down here into the Spokane Valley, and it was this blocking of this westward flow that we presume uh, led to the uh, impounding of this f roughly about 520 cubic miles of water in the western, uh, the valleys of uh, western Montana. And you'll see Grand Coulee over here, and there's an upper Grand Coulee and a lower Grand Coulee. And you'll see Moses Coulee right here. And what else do I need to point out? To you? I just want to kind of give you the geographical overview so as we zoom in on these features and look at them from the ground, you kind of have a context in which you can place this uh, phenomena that we're looking at. Here is, um, this is typically, if you tour this, the, the, the area out there, this is often a graphic you'll see at, at some of the roadside overlooks, uh, showing the relationship between uh, the lake basins itself and the, the erosional plexus, which is the channel scab land. And you'll notice here, uh, this, was, this was the Bitterroot Valley uh, basin right here. Here's the Flathead Basin. This is where I pointed out to you Flathead Lake is. So this was the Flathead Lobe of the Cordillera and Ice Sheet. This was the Purcell Trench Lobe right here which served as the ice dam. And this is the entirety of the erosional complex here. Right there you see is where the <clears throat> waters emanating over the basalt plateau all converged at that outlet right there flowed through down here. There was so much water coming down the Columbia that here at Kalama Narrows, even though it's 
it's a large valley, it, it was insufficient to convey the totality of water, so it backed all the way up here to the southern end of, of the Willamette Valley up to 400 feet deep. So that was a phenomenal amount of water. Now this wouldn't actually be technically correct according to the orthodox view of this because what you've got here is it's showing Glacial Lake Missoula at full pool, but it's also showing the uh, entire Scabland complex uh, underwater. So according to the conventional view, this wouldn't actually exist because by the time the entire channel Scabland was submerged underwater, this basin, lake basin, would have been empty. I don't know if we'll have time tonight. I'm going to get into a I'm getting into exploring an alternative concept or explanation for the origin of this flood, in which concept this would actually be more accurate. But we'll see how much time we can get to here. And here's a map of the, the lake itself. You can see it's quite a, a complex configuration here of, uh, of, of valleys and, and 180 degree turns, hairpin turns. All of this water had to drain out the Clark Fork River, which is right here. And you can see up there in the upper corner is where the ice dam would have been. And here is a NASA color photograph of two of the great uh, Scabland features. This is called the, the Cheney Palouse Scabland, which is one of the, the, the greatest of the Scabland tracks right here. It, it emanates from just south below Spokane, which is here, and it, it terminates down here at the um, at the uh, Snake River. Over here we have what's called the Telford Scabland Tract, and then we have several other things. The Crab Creek Cooley was a spillover out of Cheney Palouse because there was so great was the volume coming down here that even these, these valleys couldn't hold it all, so it spilled over and flowed over and became, now it's a coulee there called Crab Creek. So these are the two major Scabland Tracts. You see that the Telford heads right here at this bend in the Columbia where it comes out of Canada, makes its uh, westward turn, and just below there is the, um, the head of, of the Telford Scabland Tract. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna kind of take an exploration, we're gonna do a, a, trend, a traverse of the Cheney Palouse Scabland Tract down to where it meets uh, the snake. But before we do that, we'll, we'll look at this black and white image. This was taken, I think, in the late 70s, about 500 miles up. Here you see the Cheney Palouse Scabland Tract. Here's the Telford. And here now you can see Grand Coulee, Upper Grand Coulee and Lower Grand Coulee. And down here is Quincy Basin, which is another key uh, site in deciphering this phenomena. Here is Moses Coulee, named after Chief Moses. This arcuate feature right here is the Withrow Moraine. And that marks the southern terminus of the Okanagan lobe of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet. It's very, uh, very easy to, to distinguish because of the fact that south of there you basically have rolling, uh, a pol rolling Palouse landscape that's under intensive agriculture, but when you get up into the mooring itself, it's so bouldery that there's very little agriculture going on there. So you can see that's very definite line of demarcation there. In addition to Telford and Cheney Palouse Scabland tracks, Grand Coulee served as one of the major spillways coming down from here and then it's spread out once it got out of the confines of this valley here, right here it's spread out. You can actually see a remainder. This is a cutoff meander that forms uh, Moses Lake, which would have been like the final stages, the final draining of the flood would have left this here. And now it is basically a lake, a, a beautiful lake with a little town next to it. And this area right here, this gray area is called the Afrata Erratics Fan. We're gonna be looking at that in a, in a minute. This is Quincy Basin. And the water's poured down here, and right here is the uh, Frenchman Hills anticline, which sort of served as a blockade across the flow of the water and caused the water to actually part. This is kind of known uh, among geologists out there as the parting of the waters, because one great flow came down this way and another flow came down this way and met the Columbia. And here is a, a graphic from a U.S. Forest Service uh, artist rendering of the, of the whole uh, situation just prior to the, assuming the prior uh, to the breakout of the, of the lake, which is, which is this here, Lake Missoula. This is Lake Columbia, as it's now called, which was a body of water there. And you can see right here is the Cheney Palouse erosional forms. Over here is the Telford. Um, but there's something, while we're on this slide, there's something I want you to look at here, because this is one of the things that makes me begin questioning some of the, uh, 
prevailing views of this. You'll notice that the uh, Montana-Idaho boundary here is, is the watershed divide. And I want you to notice the, the enormous volume of water that's occupying the catchment basin of the, of the Clark Fork River. You'll notice that it's really almost right up to the, the divide itself. Now what you need to appreciate is that right here, this is showing that the ice dam water right at the interface, right at the uh, Idaho-Montana border. At this point, based upon studies of trim lines and high water marks in the valley, J.T. Pardee back in his 1942 paper concluded that, and, and you can actually see this for yourself, if, if I've made this traverse quite a few times through this valley, the high water marks right here in this area are 2,100 feet above the valley floor. So that means that implies a, a water depth of 2,100 feet, which is interesting because at 2,100 feet, you're looking at in excess of 960 PSI of hydraulic pressure on the heel of that ice dam, which is something that I think has been assumed with, uh, as being a possibility without really enough critical thought. Because the idea of this ice dam actually goes back to the work of T.C. Chamberlain back in the 1890s and then brought forward in, in J.T. Pardee's 1910 paper on uh, Glacial Lake Missoula. Um, and then J.T. Pardee was with the U.S. Geological Survey and his interesting, his career, his first published paper was on uh, Lake Missoula in 1910 and his final published paper in 1942 was also on it. And those were the only two papers he published on there, and they're kind of more like bookends to his, his career. But uh, it was very controversial, and uh, W.C. Alden, who was head of the Geological Survey back then, actually told Pardee to kind of keep his ideas about this glacial lake on the down low, because um, although Pardee recognized that he had come up with an explanation for, for Harlan Bretz's flood. So, the thing I want you to notice is that the volume, the, the extent of the, the amount of water within the catchment basin of the, of the Clark Fork Basin, um, the question I constantly and repeatedly ask to myself is what is the source of that water? Can only be two things, glacial melt water or rainfall. I can't imagine where else water would have come from. Either one of those things I find to be problematic and we maybe can get into that some if we have time during the question and answer. But let's keep moving on here. There you see the ice dam. You see Lake Missoula depicted at, at full pool here, which is 4,200 feet above sea level. Um, and uh, like I said, right here, the valley floor is 2,100 feet above sea level. So, you know, there we are looking at a, at, at a, uh, a hydraulic head of 2,100 feet. And here is what is being called Glacial Lake Columbia. Interesting thing about Glacial Lake Columbia is that the southern margin, the southern shoreline of Glacial Lake Columbia is right at, like it says here, can call it 2,400 feet, right? Well, 2,400 feet is the, uh, is, is actually the uh, catch, the, 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 literally the boundary of the catchment basin. You rise to 2,500 feet and it's spilling over because the whole basalt plateau tilts to the southwest. So, it, imagine you've got a saucer that's tilted slightly. So the upper rim here is right at just above 2,400 feet. Well, Glacial Lake Columbia is actually full pool, is the entire catchment basin there. Which again, I, 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 I'm wondering where is the source of the water because now what you've basically got is you've got a huge volume of water lapping at the toe of this uh, ice dam and then a mere 30 miles away up here, you've got the ice, uh, the, the interface between the ice dam and Lake Missoula, and you've got a, um, a 2,100 foot hydraulic head. In this view, we're gonna see part of Grand Coulee sticking out under the Okanagan lobe. We see Moses Coulee coming down here. This is Quincy Basin, which we're gonna look at here. All right, and over here you see the two great scab land tracks. Here comes the Cheney Palouse down this way. It meets the, the snake right here. And here comes the Telford scab land track. Comes over here, the water coming down the Telford merged with the water coming out of Grand Coulee. And together they flowed down here and they back flooded into this Quincy Basin. And ultimately, like I said, this was the parting of the water. Some water flowed down this way, some flowed around this way. This is Crab Creek Coulee and this is the Drum Heller Channels. Now, this is a map showing Missoula, Montana. And 
one of the very first things that was a clue that there was some, some hydrologic event that occurred in this region was um, both T.C. Chamberlain in the 1890s and in J.T. Pardee's 1910 paper, one of the things that he mentioned was that looking at these two mountains, Jumbo, Mount Jumbo and University Mountain here, there's something very interesting. This is just outside of Missoula, Montana. And what you see on, uh, is strand lines or shorelines uh, etched into the mountain slopes, almost up to the very tops of the mountains. Here you can see this was an old uh, photograph taken in the 30s, I believe, where uh, they're really defined nicely because of the snow. But these represent uh, the former lake. Now, the, here, here's the question. Do these strand lines represent individual lakes that formed? Because one of the theories now is that this lake formed and drained multiple times. Somewhere, depends on whose research you're looking at, in some cases 40 times, in some cases 80 or 90 times, right? I have never seen anything specific. My thought is that we're actually just looking at the draining of one lake here, because I've looked at quite a few different lake basins that have, have, have drained over the years, and you see a succession of uh, descending strand lines that looks very much like this, but on a much smaller scale. Okay, now we're gonna, we're gonna go down the uh, Cheney Palouse, which is the one on the right. The Palouse is basically just uh, several hundred feet of Luss topsoil that covers the, the Miocene basalts of the basalt plateau. Uh, very beautiful, rolling, highly fertile landscape. Uh, the problem is there's only 15 or so inches of rainfall per year. Uh, so part of the Columbia Basin project is, the reclamation project is, uh, when they built Grand Coulee Dam back in the 30s, they created a reservoir, an artificial reservoir in Upper Grand Coulee. So this is, in effect, what was covering the basalt plateau prior to the floods. And then when the floods came through, they scoured away the Palouse topsoil, exposing the dark basalt underneath. And the thing I want you to notice here is these basically these islands that would have been uh, within the, the flows. You can see the, the perimeter of the flows here. Uh, in the literature, these are usually referred to as streamlined erosional residuals. So say that real fast three times. Okay, that's good. Streamlined erosional residuals. So the water coming down here came down this way and did some very interesting incisions along the um, where the, the basalt ridge meets the um, Snake River coming in this way. And here's a kind of a closer up view of the same effect. And here are these streamlined features that you see within. And anybody, the geologist here, what do these elongated features somewhat resemble? What did I hear? Drumlins, drumlins yes, drumlins, exactly. And just for comparison, very similar forms are showing up on Mars. Now, I'm not saying that the Missoula flood was on Mars also, okay? <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. That would be quite an event. This is what one of them actually looks like from the ground. Again, it has, it's very Drumlin-like. The Stos side is the left side, the upstream side, and the right side, which is slightly less uh, in, steeply inclined, is the Lee side. But you can basically see here that th that hill is about 200 feet high, right? So this, this is what's left. We're standing, this picture is taken basically standing in the channel itself. And the scab land, the erosional part, this is classic channel scab land right here from the air showing what is called the Butte and Basin topography. And this is what basically a very swiftly moving uh, flow of water anywhere from two to 500 feet deep moving over the landscape at say around 40 miles an hour is going to leave in its wake. It's going to look like that. And, and see, the thing is, is that prior to the flood, this was covered with that thick mantle of lust topsoil. Here's another view of, of why it came, came to be called scab land. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of the classic uh, view of, of scab land. This is from maybe 400, 400, 500 feet up in the air. And this is from a, a famous uh, book, Geology Illustrated by John Shelton. Excellent book. I'm sure some of you are probably aware, familiar with this book. He was a geologist and a pilot. 
and he took this photograph. And you can see here, this, this shows very distinctly the, the flood channels and then the truncated hills of Luss right here. And these scarp faces are about 200 feet in height. The, the flow came through here, washed away the intervening Luss. And what you see here is the typical process is that it starts out as a sheet flood, removes the topsoil, then it goes to work on the bedrock. And what will it, it'll do is exploit uh, weaknesses within that bedrock and then it'll begin channeling. And you can see it's beginning to channel, down cutting a channel right here. If the floodwaters persist long enough, they will eventually become confined to that channel. And that's what happened with Grand Coulee and, and Moses Coulee. And this is standing at the base of one of those Luss Islands, just looking out over the barrenness of the basalt, uh, the, the Scabland tract. And here you see this, the Butte and Basin topography is, is quite distinct here. Um, if you see this right here, this is the, these buttes of, of, uh, of uh, columnar basalt. And then here you have the truncated Luss Hills that again are about 200 feet high. So this picture is taken standing down in one of the Scabland channels. And this is just like at the foot of one of the Luss Islands. So I'm just showing this here because all geologists know that there's a scale invariant uh, quality to geological features. And one of the ways we find that scale invariance showing up in geology, particularly in reference to the uh, floods we're looking at here tonight, is in the current ripples formation. This was a hurricane, when Hurricane Ivan came, came through in 2004, I took these pictures. I was actually able to find enough high water marks on buildings and trees to determine that the water depth right here was 23 and a half inches. And you can see the, uh, the chord length and amplitude of the ripples. You know, you're looking at, uh, you know, two to three inches chord length and about a half an inch to an inch in amplitude. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go through a sequence where you're going to see first the topographic map. This is one to 24,000 scale topographic map. Then we'll see a uh, aerial photograph. And what you'll see here, you'll notice that you've got, um, you've got these streamlined forms right here. And you can see that these were uh, stream channels cut. You see here's one coming down this way. And now what I've done is I've superimposed on that if we scale back and forth here, you'll be able to see right here. But what I want you to notice is that in a bunch of places, what do you see? What do you see over here? What do you see right here? Ripples, yes. And this was one of the things, now this is one of the um, relic features by which you can demonstrate that, yeah, there were tremendous uh, flood currents going on here. So not only the streamlined forms, but now coupled with these current ripples, We'll look at this one. You see that we've got a stream trough up here, a flood trough up here. We've got another one right here. Let's look at the flank of this, flank of this hill right here. And you'll see, what do you see? More current ripples. There are other ripples. If you look closely, you'll see that there are ripple formations up here. And then this is classic scab land formation here. And you'll notice a lot of pothole type erosion, and that's clearly evidence of highly turbulent flows, where there's vorticular uh, erosion taking place within that turbulent flows. And that's another thing that we look for in trying to determine whether or not these features are products of, of catastrophic floods, is, is the, um, the pothole formations. Let's just scroll back and forth. You'll see this is actually to the same scale map, same road, you see that? But what doesn't show up on the topographic map is this sort of stuff, the ripples. You see, and the ripples can actually be a paleocurrent indicator. The ripples will tell you uh, which direction the water was flowing because basically the cross section of the ripple, the, the stoe side is gonna be steeper, the lee side, the down current side is gonna be uh, shallower. Uh, you'll also see that in, in a lot of the ripple fields, there's a, a, a fining down current of the material that's composing the, the ripples. And you'll notice here again, streamline forms. All of these, these are maps from the uh, cheney Palouse scabland region, and you'll see these elongated. Uh, in some of the literature, these things are referred to as flutes, fluting. And they're basically where the water passed around a, 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 an obstruction within the current. If we zoom in, we're gonna focus in on this area right here. Notice the highway coming across where you got this bump right there. That's what we're gonna zoom in on. And let's see what we got going on there. You see, this is the stuff that's really was not visible 
to human eyes until we had this perspective, until we were able to get up above, first through aerial photography, then through satellite photography. A lot of this stuff is now showing up. You can go onto Google Earth now and you can see the imagery of the, of the channel Scablands in 10 seconds, what took uh, J. Harlan Brett's 20 years to draw his first map basically, because he had to go by, by car and foot and horseback to traverse this landscape every season, literally for over 20 years before he was able to compile a map that you can now see, you know, in seconds. What's the scale of the rivers? This scale? Well, let's see. You can actually see here, there's your scale bar at 500 yards. So if you could do some quick calculations in your head. <laughs> Oh, how high are the, the ripples? Yeah. Gotcha, okay, okay. The ripples here are probably not that high. These are probably less than 10 feet, probably anywhere from three to 10 feet in amplitude here. We're gonna see some much bigger ones, but, um, and that's one reason why they're not so much seen from the, from the ground is because they're, they're subtle from the ground. Um, but not all of them, as we will see here when we go on. And again, I'm just gonna go through these fast so you can see that I could have put 50 or more images like this showing how extensive these ripple formations are throughout the, the scab lands. You see that there are numerous ripples, ripple fields. And then, you know, when, the, when the, the flows become more turbulent, you end up with this ribbed effect like this right here, which has been called ribbed moraine. But you can see the very same kind of thing in any turbulent water flows. Now here's the southern end of the Cheney Palouse where it meets the um, uh, Snake River. And a couple of things I'm gonna point out to you. Here comes the Palouse River, and the original uh, channel of the Palouse River is this right here, which is now called Washtakna Coulee, right here. But because you had, this, you had this ridge right here, the floodwaters overtopped the ridge and cut several, made several incisions through the ridge. So this particular incision here captured the Palouse River, so it no longer follows its old channel, it now takes a shortcut directly over here to the Snake River. So this is the Palouse River and Canyon right in here. This over here is another one called Devil's Canyon, but it is, um, it's dry because uh, the river doesn't flow through it anymore. It, it pretty much comes, makes this right angled southerly turn right here. And here is a close up of where the capture took place. Uh, you see the Palouse coming down here. Here's the old channel, but it's, it's deflected to the south right here. This feature here is a giant flood bar right here. And when we go to the next image, you'll see there's the flood bar. You'll see that Highway 261 follows the flood bar right down here. You can see that the, the flood bar is mantled with ripples. And here's, uh, again, from John Shelton's book, this is the cross-section of Washtukna Coulee, and we can just do a, a, cro a, a current flow cross-sectional profile in there. Uh, so basically, even though this is one of the smallest of the channels, uh, you can still see it's a, a, a mile and a half wide and up to 320 feet deep. So that was carrying a pretty substantial volume of, of water. <clears throat> if we come back here, here's a close-up of uh, Palouse Canyon, and you'll notice how the floodwaters just created this interesting, just straight line incision right across the basalt, and then it seemed to get more erratic down in this area. And you'll also notice that the streamlining that it did here to the Palouse Luss. And here is from uh, Richard Foster Flint's 1938 work, looking down into Devil's Canyon which is this one over here. So that picture is taken right up here, looking down the canyon into it. And then the next one is taken from the bottom of it, looking in. And so you can really begin to get a sense of the scale of this thing. That would have been flowing brimful for a short period of time, draining that water, coming down the Cheney Palouse, uh, large basalt eroded outcrops, uh, here, and you can really see the scale of the, of the thing right here. These, these hills are nearly 400 feet high right there. Why do you think they're so straight? Those, those... The basalt, the, the boulders? No, the, the, those erosional channels. I mean, are they... Well, it has to be, I'm guessing that it was uh, probably exploiting uh, weaknesses in the rock. You know, because when this basalt plateau was, was uplifted and those anticlinal ridges formed, 
it was subjected to a lot of stresses coming from different directions. And I'm guessing what it did was there was probably a, a fracture in the basalt there that the water found very convenient to exploit. That, that would be my first explanation. How do you know that the ripples aren't associated with the erosion associated with those same types of the fissures in the basalt? The ripple, the ripples, you can actually see, I mean, the ripples are composed of, of gravel. They're composed of sediment, they're, they're, they're gravel, sand, cobbles, and boulders. You can actually see, I mean, I, have, I don't think I have them in this show, but you have looked at a lot of uh, cross sections of ripples, and I'd say it's the internal architecture is consistent. And, and again, you can see that, um, you know, in some of them you'll have, um, you can see typical, uh, you know, four-set bedding within the ripples themselves. Um, and the ripples also display, uh, they indicate what the flow regime was, whether it was upper or lower flow regime. Yes. And you can analyze the size of the ripples and the styles and back calculate how much flow. Yes. So that's how you know that the ripples are the result of the great scale flow. And that they're not structural. Yeah. Okay, this is fluvial forms, this is just typical thing you'll see along uh, a lot of, um, you know, where you have fine sediment, kind of this um, ribbed moraine look. This is kind of another interesting example of the scale invariance. When you look at some of these, you'll see like over here, you've got this almost parabolic profile of some of these things. And then when we go to the Palouse landscape, you'll see very similar, but again, on a much larger scale. Now, it would suggest that what happened was again, the initial flood stage was a sheet flood over the Palouse. And then it began to channelize, and once it, once it eroded the, the, the overlying one to 200 foot thick layer of, of, of loss, it then, then the, the, um, the sheet floods became channelized within the Cheney Palouse and within the Telford. But prior to that, there would have been a, a, a lower flow regime going over this um, Palouse landscape. I would suggest molding it into these softened forms. And almost when you're there and look at it, it almost looks like a, a, you know, a frozen ocean uh, in effect. What about interference ripples? Do you know what interference No, I don't. Interference ripples are when, if you go to the beach at low tide, oh. you'll see in the ponds where the wind will blow one direction and create ripples in that direction, and then, it, and then blow in a different direction and create ripples in that direction. Yes, now I know what you're talking I just never call them that, but yeah. I, yeah, I, w I think you're probably right. And so here's Palouse Falls. This is one of the uh, cataracts that, you know, the modern day Palouse River is minuscule compared to the size of the original cataract. Uh, and you can see some, some very tortured basalt there when the uh, flood flows came through here. And I think if I recall right, I think Victor Baker estimated the uh, peak discharge through Cheney Palouse at, at somewhere up close to 150 or 200 million uh, cubic feet per second. Uh, he did a lot of the hydrological analysis back in the 70s that, that basically confirmed Brett's uh, more qualitative uh, dealing with this evidence. So there's where Palouse Falls is. And then at the mouth, there's looking below the falls, looking down. Uh, down the canyon, which is over 400 feet high here. And here's where the Palouse meets the Snake River, right here. And at the mouth, there's two great gravel bars splayed out from the mouth, one going up the Snake and the other one going down the Snake. Um, and to give you a sense of the scale here, let's see, this is Lion's Ferry. This is looking, the uh, Palouse River's coming in here from the left, and this is the Snake. And here are the two gravel bars. The, the floods came down this way, and, and you can actually see that how it, it, it splayed out this way. And there's gravel operations, gravel quarry operations going on on this bar, which has obscured the, there was at one time very distinct, elegant current ripples on this particular bar right here, which are obscured because of the quarrying operations. But to give you a sense again of the scale, you see the Lions Ferry Bridge coming across right here onto this. Here comes the highway down this way. And that is the bar, this bar right here. We're looking at that from, from this vantage point over here. And then here's the other one. There's the Lions Ferry Bridge and there's the other gravel bar. And it's somewhere around 250 feet above the actual river level. 
So it's a fossil feature that's been sitting there since the floods were over and hasn't really been modified much at all, except like the other bar is now being modified because of the fact that, that there are uh, gravel quarrying operations going on. So then there's the Telford Scabland tract. We're not going to spend much time on that. I'm going to kind of keep going, but you can see here this incipient channelization that's taking place here. Um, and each of these is like a, a, a the stream uh, did multiple uh, separations here, but ultimately all converged down here into this Crab Creek Coulee that flowed over here and met up with Grand Coulee. So here's Upper Grand Coulee, here's Lower Grand Coulee, here's Telford, you can see the, the follow the path of the water right down here, and they all, this water all met in this area right here and flowed into this Quincy Basin. The little town of Afrata or Afrata gives its name to the fan, which you're gonna see here in a second. But we're gonna, we're gonna take a little trip down Grand Coulee. And what you'll see here is, right up here is Grand Coulee Dam. And then here's the head of Grand Coulee at the Great Notch. It comes down here. This is the Coulee monocline. For those of you that don't know, a monocline is just a single upward fold in the bedrock. And that's what you've got here, as opposed to an anticline or a syncline, which is a downfold, an anticline is an upfold. Uh, a monocline is a single fold, and we've got a, a, the Cooley monocline, as it's called right here. Um, one of the things that, that Brett realized when he was looking at this was that when the flow came down <clears throat> this way, it spilled over the edge of the monocline right here. And the, uh, each one of these little squares is a mile, uh, a one mile square. And the region that he estimated that the uh, water was spilling over the monocline was right at four to five miles and the height was 900 feet. So that would have been probably for a short period of time the grandest waterfall on Earth. If you picture a waterfall four to five miles wide and 900 feet high, and the estimated flow through there was about 300 million cubic feet per second, which is if you took every river on Earth, every river from every continent, added it all together times 10, you would have roughly the flow coming through Grand Coulee. So that would have been probably for a short period of time the grandest waterfall on Earth. If you picture a waterfall four to five miles wide and 900 feet high, and the estimated flow through there was about 300 million cubic feet per second, which is if you took every river on Earth, every river from every continent, added it all together times 10, you would have roughly the flow coming through Grand Coulee. And then what happens is lower Grand Coulee, you see that the, the monocline, the flexure of the monocline weakened the rock along, along the ridge here. And so the water began to exploit that weakened bedrock, basalt bedrock there. And so the lower Grand Coulee becomes confined it almost follows parallel the monocline and then spills out right here into the upper uh, rim of Quincy Basin. And here's what's called the Great Notch at the, he the head of Grand Coulee right here. And what's interesting is the, the bedrock elevation all from up here at the, at the top of the notch all the way across here is about 2,400 feet, like I pointed out earlier. And that's the, the basically, um, once the water in Lake Columbia, which occupied now, what is now occupied by Franklin Roosevelt Lake, rose up to that level, it began to spill over the northern rim of the basalt plateau. But also to uh, begin cutting the, uh, the upper Grand Coulee, which came right down here. Now, I'm gonna call your attention to uh, this feature right here, which is called Steamboat Rock. And you know, when you begin to look at these uh, flood type features, you'll see that a lot of them have names that are suggestive of their connection with uh, hydrology and water flows and stuff. Um, you know, Steamboat Rock is actually used several times, but this is probably the most well-known Steamboat Rock that sits uh, right in the coulee, and it's, and it's a remnant. Uh, if the floodwaters had persisted for a matter of a few more days or a few more weeks, there would be no Steamboat Rock. It's very much could be compared to Goat Island in uh, uh, above Niagara Falls. But let's go on here. Here's an aerial view that was in Paul Weiss's little book from the 70s. Um, and we're looking south down upper Grand Coulee and there's Steamboat Rock right out there. 
And you can see it's, it's very mesa-like. Um, it, it's very, compared to some of the mesas in the southwest, it's remarkably similar in, in scale and size. Again, like I said, it's a, it's a remnant. And prior to the flood, you have to bear in mind that all of this across here, this was all continuous. Here, there's one to 24,000 of Steamboat Rock. Um, you'll notice that there's um, a tributary can uh, canyon coming in here, Northrop Canyon coming in, which was tributary to the Cooley. Steamboat Rock is right here. We see Castle Rock, and here's an unnamed cataract right there. So if anybody has any good names, maybe we could come up with something and get it on the maps, because uh, nobody's bothered to name it yet. Now, it <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> and here is, here's an aerial photograph that I took of the unnamed cataract, and here's Castle Rock. Right there, that little corner is a section of Steamboat Rock. Now this is interesting because here's where you see granitic rocks giving away, see there's granites out here, and these granites give way to the basalt. And this is right there at that transition between these, um, the granite bedrock that actually extends up into British Columbia and the basalt plateau actually occurs right here in this region. Here's an old photograph, aerial photograph of, the, of Steamboat Rock. Here's one from the ground, and this is showing that there's actually a coulee on the top of Steamboat Rock. Now, based on the trim lines that are on the hillsides outside of Grand Coulee itself, uh, they were able to calculate that the minimum depth of water at one point over the top of Steamboat Rock was 200 feet. And so this, this uh, right here, this spillway right here was, would have been carved. So again, most likely what you first had was a sheet flow moving over the basalt. It exploited weaknesses in the rock and then began downcutting. Once it began downcutting, the water then became confined to that channel. And this is the gravel pit, gravel quarry that's at the mouth of that Northrop Canyon, which is a very interesting thing that I really like to uh, get deeper into the sedimentology of this whole thing because there's a whole story written here. But we don't have a lot of time, but we can see that some of the clasts within these sediments are pretty sizable. Uh, but we also see some interesting bedding going on right here, which suggests you, ha you had flows coming into North Thorpe Canyon into Grand Coulee. You also had backflows going out of Grand Coulee back up into Northrop Canyon. Now Northrop Canyon is, is ha inhabited mostly by rattlesnakes. And here is a Google Earth of the Great Cataract Complex that separates Upper Grand Coulee from Lower Grand Coulee. And this is really one of the most fascinating. Here again, it's from Shelton's book. This is only part of the complex. And you can see here one great alcove and then you see part of a, a, a separating rock here that are called blade rocks that separate one alcove from another. And notice the bedrock. This is something that we see very typically, um, this scoured bedrock. Now, the water flowing over this bedrock is estimated to have been right here in this between 350 and 400 feet deep. This is what's called a receding cataract. So as the water is rushing over the, the, the lip of this thing, it's plucking the basalt and eating it upstream. And down below Dry Falls Cataract here, you can see these gigantic boulders, some of them which are at least the size of the room that we're in right now, piled up. And just for some scale again, here's Niagara Falls. Who, who's been to Niagara Falls here? Okay, so it's pretty impressive, isn't it? I think it's about 125 feet in height. Some are on this classic horseshoe shaped profile. Here's another version. Now what I've done is I've taken this photograph and I've superimposed it at the same scale over uh, Dry Falls so you can kind of get a sense of, of the magnitude of this thing. And we're actually only looking at part of the complex. You can actually see there's more of it. It continues. The whole complex is, is roughly five miles wide, a little bit shy of 400 feet in height. And so you can see that it would have utterly dwarfed Niagara Falls. And here's from the ground level, looking at the um, two uh, westernmost alcoves. And again, I've put Horseshoe Falls and Niagara near its scale. So you can really begin to appreciate the, the... Now, the thing is, is that at the peak of the flood, you wouldn't have seen really a waterfall here. What you would have seen was a bump in the water. You would have seen just very uh, turbid water flowing, uh, choked with um, 
a lot of icebergs, and I'll show you how we know that there were a lot of icebergs in the water. Um, only at the latter stages was this actually a waterfall. As the, as the source of the floodwaters began to decline, and we went from 300 million down to 200, 100 million, and eventually it, it, um, the flow ended, and, but during only the latter stages would we have actually seen a waterfall here. And this is below dry falls, looking down into the head of uh, uh, lower Grand Coulee. And here where you can actually see when you look at the east side compared to the west side of the Coulee, the, the, difference, the, the elevation difference in the monocline really is apparent. And these are the kind of things you see. This is the Grand Ronde basalt, which was one of the, the big basalt outflows um, back in Miocene times. And what the floodwaters did was basically stripped the overlying basalt layer by layer and left this shelf. So this is an erosional shelf rather than a depositional shelf. You can see that the truncated sides of the coulee are here and they left a lot of hanging valleys, which are generally dry except during rainfalls, which they didn't have temporary waterfalls. Notice on along the flanks, this is not normal talus. This is basically uh, flood sediment. This is bouldery material that was being carried in the water of the flood that was deposited along the flanks of the coulee, also along the floor of the coulee once the, the floodwaters subsided. And here is at the mouth of the coulee looking north. So you can really see those hanging valleys. Whoops, I don't want to fall off the stage here in my excitement. <laughs> but we're standing on the northern uh, edge of the Ephrata erratics fan looking into the Cooley mouth. And here's the topo map showing lower Grand Cooley spreading out into the fan here. Um, Moses Lake is actually into the fan. We can look at the fan and there's a down current fining. We have very coarse, large boulders up in the northern end and then it, it gets progressively finer as we move to the south and as the water stills into the Quincy Basin. And that's roughly the outline, roughly the outline of the fan itself, the fan, which is the material that was eroded out of the coulees and then deposited because when the water is confined, it has a high, high energy, right? It's moving faster. When it opens into a basin, it slows down. As it slows down, its competency to transport sediment declines, and it begins to deposit stuff. And it deposits the largest material first, and then successively finer material. And this is another paleocurrent indicator that you can use when you're looking at a, a, a section of, of uh, stratigraphy like this. If you see very definite larger clasts or boulders on one side getting progressively smaller, you know that that's the current direction. So here's a, another digital relief map of Quincy Basin, and you can see the Frenchman Hills anticline right here that served as a major flow obstruction to all of this water. Now a couple of things I'm going to point out to you here. Here's the Drumheller channels, and this was the parting of the waters I was talking about. Drumheller channels, this right here is nine miles wide, okay? So what happens is Quincy Basin levels out. So you've got up there where the Grand Coulee is, you've got about, it's about a 20-foot fall per mile, right? And then it almost levels out right here in Quincy Basin. So what happens is that the water slows down and it pools up here in Quincy Basin. But there were three great spillover spillways out of the western rim over here of the basin. You had one here, one here, and one up here called Crater Coulee, which we're going to look at a little closer. Crater Coulee, the, the Babcock Ridge, which is this ridge right here, is 400 feet above this. So in order for the water to spill over Babcock Ridge here and cut this coulee right here, it had to be 400 feet deep. And that's a lot of water. And bear in mind that the spillway out of Quincy Basin is nine miles wide. So you would have had basically a temporary river here nine miles wide and somewhere between three and 400 feet deep. And as it's hitting uh, the Drumheller channels, what's happening is the gradient is going from almost level to again about 15 feet per mile. So what's happening is once that water hits that rim, it starts speeding up. And, and then of course you can see what's happening here is that it's beginning to create that erosional forms which is typical scab land like. Here's the fan itself. Now this fan is a couple hundred feet thick and it covers hundreds of square miles. And you can see a mixture of mostly basalt but there's also some pink granites in there that probably had their source either uh, north of here, where I pointed out to you that there was granite uh, bedrock outcropping uh, north of the basalt plateau on up into Canada. 
And you can see some of that pink granite right there. But this is, of course, the typical uh, basalt of the Colombian basalt group here. And it, you can just see it just, it's sp spread over um, many, many square miles. Is that the granite that's just been caught up in the glacier? Yes, I'm guessing it was probably in the glacier or it may have been transported. See, one of the things we won't get into today, but I've done two, two traverses up the Okanagan Valley and I'm con almost convinced now that you had uh, enormous floods heading down the Okanagan Valley. And there are this pink granite up in that area, so I'm guessing that that might have been one possible source. But it's gonna take another couple of trips back there, I think, and so I, I will mention it if anybody's interested. Uh, sometime this summer, I'd like to get back out there for about eight days and uh, fill in some of the gaps. And uh, be great to have a, a team. So you can get a sense here of the, the what the Ephrata erratics fan actually is. It's, and this is from the air, about 2,500 feet altitude. The larger rocks here, like did you see right here, that rock there is about the size of the room we're sitting in. So it gives you a sense of the scale. And here's by comparison, Mars. Now I'm not planning any expeditions to Mars next summer. Man. Pardon? I said man. Oh, sorry. It's, 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 in, it's on the bucket list, though. Uh, okay, now we're going to move over to Mo Mighty Moses Cooley, which is this feature here, which is very close to Grand Cooley in scale and grandeur, um, which, again, to me is a little bit problematic within the, within the, the, the uh, standard explanations. What we got here with Romoraine, here, very clearly demarked, you'll see that the head of the coulee is actually up, would have been up under the, the, the terminus of the Okanagan lobe, which I find interesting. But it comes down, there's an upper Moses coulee, there's a right angle turn right here called the, um, oh, the devil's something. A lot of stuff having to do with the devil out here, I've noticed. <laughs> the devil this and the devil that. Okay, and then here's lower Moses coulee, and it meets the Columbia down here in this V-shaped form. Yeah, here you can see, here's Lower Grand Coulee, here's Moses Coulee, extending right off the um, southern terminus of the Okanagan lobe. One of the things I'm having a problem with is, is how to explain Moses Coulee as a result of the draining of Lake Missoula. And here you can see the Withrow Moraine, you can see the head of you have Green Lake and Jameson Lake occupying, which are, are basically a lot of these lakes occupy scour troughs that have been scoured out and left behind uh, as part of the erosion. Uh, elevation 570 miles. And again, you'll see that, the, that there seems to be no genetic link between the head of Moses Cooley and any flow that would have been coming from the west. Water on top of the ice. Superglacial. Now see this, I, I'm looking and considering possible superglacial and subglacial. Yeah. yeah as being something that needs to be explored further. And this would have just a little graphic to show, um, but there's something else that I find very interesting. You won't see this clearly in this unless I point it out to you. Up here, this is called Alta, Alta Lake, right here, and it's right, and we're gonna be coming back to that in a minute, because there's something, there's a coulee that follows the western margin of the Okanagan lobe, which I find very difficult to explain by waters issuing from Western Montana. But here is uh, the transition between upper, oh yeah, three devils cataract complex, that's what this is called. Not just one devil, but three devils. Right in here, see, and this is the transition from upper Moses Cooley to lower Moses Cooley is right in here. And there's a whole set of cataracts and stuff that's in here. And then you get down here and here's lower Moses Cooley. There's boring in the coulee itself, which is interesting, and I imagine we're gonna be running out of time soon because I'd really like to get into some of the background on some of these thinking, but the assumption has always been that, the, that, that radiocarbon dating of organic material found associated with the uh, Okanagan moraine is dated to uh, up to 20,000 years, right? So the assumption was is that the moraine uh, was formed by the Okanagan lobe, which I assume to be correct, but that Moses Cooley had to proceed because the moraine is deposited down in the coulee itself. So the coulee would have had to already have been there. 
right? Which would have made Moses Cooley more than 20,000 years old, which would have made it thousands of years older than the Scabland tracks and even Grand Cooley. I question that. And I get, the reason is, is because if Moses Cooley was produced by a subglacial flood, we know from studying Yokolops up in Iceland that after the hydraulic pressure is diminished when the floodwaters recede, that, the, that the, the ice roof will then collapse down onto the substrate. And I would suggest that that might be an explanation here. Because if we assume that Moses Cooley was thousands of years older than, than the supposed draining of Glacial Lake Missoula, then to what do we attribute it? Because Moses Cooley is, is really phenomenal, as you're going to see here. We'll get into it. Here is the, the confluence of the Moses, Moses Cooley with the Columbia. And you can begin to see there's mass, just like it where the Palouse hits the snake, there's massive gravel bars splayed out at the mouth. And we had massively augmented flows coming down the Columbia, and we had the flows coming down Moses Cooley there. Here's an aerial shot looking down onto that confluence. So we're looking up Moses Cooley right here. And here's the Columbia. The next one you can actually see, here's the Columbia River down here. And you can see the scale. This, this whole gravel deposit, I think from northern end to southern end, is close to 10 miles. It's at least 400 feet thick. So this is material that was quarried out in the creation of Moses Cooley. And if we go back one, you're going to see that, yeah, here we go. Here's looking at the eastern flank, looking south. And you can see here how these, the, 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 the pre-flood drainage divide was basically irrelevant to this flow that created Moses Cooley. The wash through here and basically truncated these hills. You can see typical scab land formation along here. There's about a minimum of 200 feet of <clears throat> coarse uh, gravel cobble sediment uh, forming the floor of the Cooley in here. And here you can see the, the extensive gravel that came out here. The modern day Columbia uh, dissects that gravel. And here we have something very interesting. This is called West Bar. And I pointed out to you Crater Coulee a few minutes ago. Here, this is it right here. This was one of the spillover channels out of Quincy Basin. And uh, this rim here is again 400 feet above the, the sill of uh, Drumheller channels. Let's take a closer look at this. First, we'll look up into the mouth of Moses Cooley from standing on the gravel bar. Again, notice this wash up, this gravel, coarse gravel sediment that you find deposited all along the flanks. Just contextual here. Here's Quincy Basin. Here's West Bar. Here's one spillover channel. Here's another one. Now you can see them pretty clear here. We've got uh, Crater Cooley right there. We've got Potholes Cataract there and Frenchman Springs Cataract right here. So there was so much water coming into Quincy Basin that even a nine mile wide, 400 or 300 foot deep flow over this spillway was not enough to, to carry the, the volume of water coming in at the north end. So it ponded in this whole thing and spilled over in these three places on the western rim. And here is Potholes Cataract and it was a map of this that was newly released by the U.S. Geological Survey in 1910 that first piqued uh, J. Harlan Brett's interest in this whole He looked at this map that had been released of Potholes Cataract and said, what the heck is that? And this is what led to this 30 years of study, now, which is interesting. 1910, same year that Pardee wrote his first paper on Glacial Lake Missoula, and of course the same year that Mark Twain died as Halley's Comet was coming over. Not that that has anything to do with any of it, but it was an interesting year. <laughs> and here's Potholes Cataract from the air. And here is, we find the remnant blade rock that separates the two great alcoves. Down here in the distance is the Columbia. And actually, we could, you can't tell too much from here, but when you see it firsthand, you realize that the top of this is all scab land, so the water at one point was completely overtopping all of this. And here is standing on the rim of the south alcove. And this is part of the uh, north alcove over here. The Columbia is actually way down in here. And here's Frenchman Springs Cataract, the southern spillway channel out of Quincy Basin. And there's a Google Earth 
where you can see the blade rock that separates the two alcoves. Had the, had the flood continued at some indeterminate length of time from days to a few weeks or whatever, that blade rock would have been gone. And here's looking into Frenchman Coulee, and you can kind of see the roads down there to get a sense of scale. And now we're going to look at West Bar, which is this. Which you'll notice here that um, here's Quincy Basin, and here's Moses Cooley coming in, meeting the Columbia. And then you come down here, and here's this three-mile-long, 400-foot thick uh, gravel bar. And there's an aerial shot of the gravel bar. And this is one of the most well-known of the giant current ripple formations. The largest of these current ripples have amplitude of 30 to 50 feet and a uh, wavelength of uh, two to 400 feet. So they're, they're pretty impressive. I've got another shot that I took from across the river where you can see, and there's actually right, if you look very close, right there. Now, if that guy had been standing there during the flood, he probably wouldn't have survived. <laughs> and again, you see more of this wash up gravel over here. And here's Drumheller Channels. And this is, all, this is very interesting stuff up in here, this erosional forms. Yeah, so this was the parting of the waters. Here's Drumheller Channels comes down. One flow hit Saddle Mountain Anticline here, flowed off to the west. The rest of it came and spilled around this way. And this is that, that's this stuff here. I'm not sure what to call that. Anybody got any good suggestions? Brandon, you're probably down about five minutes if, if you want to do any Q&A. Oh, okay. Well, anybody got any quick questions? I sure would like to show one minute on some of these basalt bowl, some of the erratics. Yeah, what is it? What was the source of all the water? Pardon me? What was the source of all the water? Well, you know, you had nearly over a million cubic kilometers of Cordillera and ice, which is now not there. And you had probably one quarter of that was in the headwaters of the Columbia, right? We did our second trip to Canada last summer because what I was trying to do is see those uh, north-south transecting valleys like the Purcell Trench and the... Um, the uh, Rocky Mountain Trench as possible conduits for meltwater. And that will be a whole other discussion that maybe I can come back in the fall or something and do a follow-up, and we can get into that. Well, what was the time frame? Yeah, yeah. Start to finish. The time frame, it depends on how you date it. Now, the dating is based on a Mount, uh, a Mount St. Helens set S. Tephra that's sandwiched in some of the slack water sediments near, near Wallula Gap. That that ash is dating to about 12,900 to 13,000 years. What they then, what, the, 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 the thinking goes like this, and we don't really have time to get into that, I guess, because we've only got five minutes left, but basically in the slack water sediments, you have what are called rhythmites, which are layers that were, whether they were produced by um, hydraulic pulsation within one standing body of water or were produced by separate floods is one of the controversies. But you find this Mount St. Helens set S. Tephra sandwiched in there, which has been accurately dated to 13,000 years. Over that is about another 14 or 15 or 16 layers, right? If you assume that those, each of those layers represents a, a separate outburst flood from Lake Missoula, you then have to extrapolate from that and assume how long it would take to accumulate you know, 400, 500 cubic miles of water in Lake Missoula, which is generally taken as 50 to 100 years. And then from there, you can extrapolate based on the number of layers. If each one was a filling of Lake Missoula, it's going to take between 2,000 and 3,000 years for the entire phenomena. Yes? It just seems like this idea of 70 or 80 different outbursts and all that, that you'd be able to tell the difference when you look at the erosional features between the effects of multiple outbursts what you've been showing us sounds like the simplest explanation is a single event, you know. Well, that's, that's the line that you sound like you've been following. That. <clears throat> that's the hypothesis. But I, I, actually, I'm looking at two events, bracketed, because yeah. if you look at... Uh, not 70 or 80. I'm having trouble with that Be for the simple reason that I'm having trouble with e getting my head around even one glacier dam holding in 2,000 hydro feet of a hydraulic head of water. Because, you know, looking at, at modern examples of outburst floods, 
what you see is that typically the largest outburst floods, which are the, caused by the eruption of Vatna Yokel in Iceland, are three orders of magnitude smaller. I mean, the largest modern Yokel Alps is less than one thousandth of the flow that came through Grand Coulee. Okay. Now, some more continental ice sheets to see the effects. So you know, give it another 50 years and go look at Antarctica. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah. What was the time frame from dam break to the well, the, oh, probably a couple of weeks, because if you've got 520 cubic miles of water in the, in the Missoula Reservoir, and you've got basically Pardee calculated 9.46 cubic miles per hour going through the Clark Fork Valley. So do the math, 9.46 into 500. But, but of course, you're going to have diminishing current flow, so the initial outburst is going to be the Q, your peak discharge, is going to be much greater, and it's going to diminish throughout there. But you know, clearly you can, at, at nine or, you know, eight, nine mi cubic miles per hour, it's not going to take but a few days to drain the entire reservoir. Yeah. So why did this happen further to the east? Why don't we see the same phenomenon? Mainly because of the gradient. You see, from, from, from the discharge points at the head of, uh, at, at the Columbia Basalt Plateau to the ocean, you've got a much steeper gradient. Than, but there are mega flood features all up and down the Mississippi Valley, up and down the Missouri Valley, the St. Croix. I mean, yes, there, you can go across the entire. I've actually traveled with Brad over there through most of the southern margin of the Laurentide Ice Sheet. And there were catastrophic floods everywhere, everywhere. But they didn't do the same amount of work as we saw here simply because the gradients, you know, to get from the southern margin of the Laurentide Ice Sheet there, say in the headwaters of the Mississippi down to the Gulf of Mexico, you're looking at three times the, the horizontal distance as you're looking at from the southern margin of the Cordilleran to get to the Pacific. That's the main difference. Another one of the most uh, dramatic examples of how we're looking at major catastrophic flows are the uh, erratics that are found strewn by the thousands throughout the flood path. And if you look here, you'll see up here on the ridge, you see these giant erratics up here. There was actually two people standing here and I took them out of the picture just so you could get a sense of the scale of the thing. Now I'll put them back in. <laughs> now, there, again, there are thousands of these things. And here's another one. Um, stranded on a ridge 400 feet above the modern uh, Lake Chelan that you see right down there in the background right there. There's a hell of an erratic. 400 feet above the Columbia just by Wenatchee, Washington. So how did those erratics get there? This is one of the most famous ones, Jaeger Rock. What's interesting about this, you see it's sitting in a berg mound. So when you've got these You've got icebergs being carried in the floodwaters. Those icebergs are not clean ice. They're very dirty ice. They're sediment laden. So when an iceberg comes to ground, it melts away. It'll leave a, what they call a berg mound, right? And so you see that this Jaeger rock is sitting right there in a berg mound. And this is, a, this is a, an interesting graphic from an 1866 uh, book on geology, illustrated by Edouard Rieu, who was the uh, illustrator for all of Jules Verne's original novels. But based upon uh, Louis Figure's description, he depicted, this is what Figure was, was theorizing back in 1866. And when I saw this, I said, well, here, this is exactly what, you know, depicts what we're seeing there throughout the, the Scabland channels and the, sort of the scale of the thing. Icebergs being carried into torrential floodwaters, erratic boulders on the ice sheets, which is a thing that demands explanation in itself. And the last thing I'll show you, and I pointed out to you earlier, Alta Lake, which is right here. Well, if you look at right this right here, here is a coulee. And this coulee marks the western edge of the Okanagan lobe, right? And if we look at that coulee, here's a Google Earth. Can we? Why is it so washed out? Did we turn the lights back on? Just, oh, that's to tell us we have to leave? Yes. Can, can somebody, anybody can pay off the guard for an extra? <laughs> There we see Alta Cooley, and Alta Cooley marks the western edge of the Okanagan lobe. And if we go through it, here's from the ground. Here's looking south through the Cooley. Here's looking north, and what I did was a transect through it, showing its relationship to the Okanagan lobe. The, the Cooley itself, it was uh, one of the margins of the Cooley, so it's a nice marginal channel. Uh, 
And if it was flowing rim full, I put the Empire State Building in there just for scale. Now, my point there of Alta Coulee is that when you look at this, there's Alta Lake right up there. So again, I'm having problems going, okay, now how exactly do we get the water from Western Montana over to Alta Coulee with the, with the Okanagan lobe intervening? And why would it not deflect south either through Cheney Palouse or Telford or Grand Coulee? Why would it go over there and form that ice marginal channel? Well, I think you can actually trace the source of Alta Coulee right up into the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia. And that's one of the things that um, I'm interested in following up on. So we won't get into the ice dam here, other than this will be, I promise, the very last thing. I did two transects, one right here where the, the valley is constricted and one right here where the valley opens out. Now right in here somewhere is where the ice dam water interface supposedly occurred, right? So first we'll look at this transect cross section and then we'll look at this one right here where it widens out into the basin. So, Here's a northeast to southwest transect. The high water mark was at 4,200 feet. So I put that in right there, right? Now I'll put the Empire State Building in for scale. In the next one, I've gone into the basin, put the high water mark at 4,200, and now I'm gonna put the skyline of Atlanta in there for scale. So you can really begin to get a sense of how enormous these flows were. Here's a map of Atlanta, and the, the green dot is us, right there at Fernbank Museum. If that flow was flowing to our west from here, and we were right on the edge of it, it would be basically that wide. So all of downtown Atlanta, bye-bye. And everything from here for seven miles over. And then I did one more with the skyline of Atlanta, and I put that 2,100 foot uh, water flow through Clark Fork in there. And see, here's why I'm having trouble picturing how glacial ice is ever going to have the competency to hold water in at that tremendous potential energy that's got to be there, especially when you realize that this must be a temperate glacial lobe, which means it's riding on a layer of basal meltwater and is riven with moulins and fractures and interstitial cavities. It is not going to be a good material for holding water in at any extreme hydraulic pressure. That's why I'm thinking maybe we should consider that there might be an alternative explanation, which we won't get into today, but maybe in a future talk we could do that. So the last slide will be this one right here. <clears throat> Here's Pardee's calculation for the flow out Clark Fork, 9.46. That's what we just saw with the profile of Atlanta. Uh, Victor Baker's calculation down here below the, the ice dam was 17.1 cubic miles per hour. The flow through Wallula Gap is 10.78. What does this suggest to you? Some discrepancy going on here. Why is Victor Baker's almost twice what Pardee's was? And one assu assumes that if, the, if this was correct, which is based on the Chesi formula, which should be fairly correct, the, the outflow 9.64 the flow through Wallula Gap is greater than the outflow from here, and yet the ponding was so great above Wallula Gap that it formed a thousand foot deep temporary lake. So think about that. Can it be the density of the area? No, I think what it is is that we have to consider that there were multiple sources of flood water. Pardon me? Multiple tributaries. Multiple tributaries. Right. That I, my thought is that the sole source of water couldn't have been here. And why is this almost double? Well, my first thought is that there are gravel pits along in here that I've looked at that have Purcell Trench provenance in it, which means there are rocks in gravel pits in here that came from the Purcell Trench up here. So I'm thinking that this is probably gonna be evidence that, the, that this flow was the combined flow of Purcell Trench and Clark Fork coming down this way. And augmented by flows coming separately over this way. And this is why you could have a thousand foot deep ponding above uh, Wallula Gap right there. There's a lot more I could show you. We didn't even get into looking at the evidence over here in, in Lake Missoula or the evidence down here, but maybe we can do a future lecture where we could explore all of that. So again, if anybody's interested, um, 
talk to Brad over there because we're going to be organizing another trip out there this summer. Um, and I'd love to have all of you come with. <laughs> also, make a donation to the AGS. <laughs>